Okay, so I've got everything in manual mode. I hope this uh, is working okay. This is a 60th of a second frame rate uh, at f3.5, manual mode, autofocus. Let's get our focus dialed in here. Yeah, that's pretty good. All right, so here's the test setup. So I've got a oscillator on the top. It has two channels. It has a channel one and channel two. The oscilloscope, I'm going to show what the two waves actually look like. So you can see that uh, channel one, let's see if I get this right, channel one is three, uh, three kilohertz, three thousand hertz. And the way I have these displayed right now is I'm tracing these in time. So the oscilloscope has a time base. So you can see it sweeps from left to right and alternates on the two channels, one and two. And it's plotting the amplitude of the sine wave across time. So this just gives a view, you know, it's kind of the classic view of a, a frequency, right? And you can see that, um, well, we'll change the position. This is channel one. So that has a lower frequency because the troughs and the valleys are spaced farther apart. But uh, the, the top one is... Um, the um, the two kilohertz frequency and those are spaced a little bit closer together because of the frequency. So looking at it this way, you can't really see the Lisaju patterns. To do that, you've got to feed the B channel, which is channel two, I'll say. You've got to feed that so that the voltage it affects the deflection on the screen. So you're plotting you're plotting the change in voltage that you see as troughs and valleys here as position on the screen. So you're going to take this trace that will determine the X position and the voltage level of the Y trace will determine the Y direction. So we can do that by turning off the time base and turning it into XY plotting mode. So it does exactly what I described. And that's a different view of those same two traces. They're just being plotted, their amplitudes are being plotted opposite to one another. And uh, that is what creates the Lisa Zhu pattern. Now, I know you probably can't see it here, but I have the cursor on frequency 1 set to the 1 hertz, you can see an underline here, to the 1 hertz variation. So I'm going to vary the frequency by a couple of hertz. And you can see that's what begins the rotation because the two frequencies start slipping in and out of phase when you do that. You probably can't see it because of the bloom on the display in the video, but varying that frequency will vary the, uh, the apparent rotation rate. And we can make an apparent reversal of whatever you were seeing before by making that frequency lower than the other frequency. Uh, so you're changing the, the ratio slightly and causing it to slip in and out of phase. And that creates the, um, the apparent rotation. So I know that's not a very, very good explanation, but it's um, the best extemporaneous one I, or contemporaneous one I can come up with. So there you go. But uh, I think it's very cool that you can generate pseudo stereo pairs from this. I think that's fascinating. Um, we used to use this to calculate frequencies, or, or engineers did, and I, I didn't personally, other than play with it, but years ago, before frequency counters, engineers would use these. They would have one known frequency, and by counting the number of bumps in the top and the bottom, they could determine the ratio between a uh, known and an unknown frequency and come up with a calculation uh, of what that frequency would be. And it was pretty accurate, because all you had to do is get the the figure to stop rotating and you knew you had a perfect integral ratio uh, determined. Just kind of cool. You can kind of stop it. Depends how accurate your oscillator is, but this is it's pretty good. I can almost stop it. There's a little bit of drift. So, so here's where they can, here's where you get the perceptual shift where the lines align and that's where you can, the, the apparent direction of rotation seems to shift. So you can kind of see it go back and forth there. So I guess I could generate a stereo pair by giving like a head-on view where you're seeing the most lines. So here's the straight-on view.
So my thought was to, you know, go three degrees to the left, like that, try to freeze it, and then go back here and get three degrees to the right, take a shot, and um, that would give you uh, an apparent stereo image, I think. So I think the best way to do that would be to take the videos that I had shot in the dimmer light, uh, you know, with more contrast, and then try to do some frame grabs from that uh, rotation video and uh, try to generate some pairs from that. So that's, uh, that's the deal.